second. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Education ESA series of webinars with the U.S. Higher Education representatives. Today, we are with Hamilton College, and uh, we are actually here to uh, hear what do admission officers look for international applicants, especially when talking about the highly selective uh, liberal arts colleges such as Hamilton. Today, we have Anna and Brenna with us, who are representatives of uh, Hamilton College, and uh, we do hope you will enjoy the session, and I know I will. Thank you. Uh, Anna? So thank you so much again for this opportunity and thank you to everyone who has called in this afternoon to learn some more about Hamilton College. So I want to make sure um, to uh, introduce myself. My name is Anna Weiss. I am Associate Dean of Admission. I am Director of International Recruitment. And then I would love if my uh, two co-presenters, because we are going to have both my uh, colleague who works in our office and one of our current students will also be sharing some of his experiences with you. And he is a, a proud Education USA alumni. So um, we want, I want to give them the opportunity to introduce themselves. Brenna? Great. Thanks, Anna. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Brenna May. I'm a Senior Assistant Dean of Admission, and I serve on the International Recruitment Team at Hamilton. And specifically, I do work with students from Europe. So if you eventually end up applying to Hamilton, then I might be the one to read your application. Hi everyone, my name is Lori. I'm the student and um, <laughs> I have just finished my second year here at Hamilton. I'm originally from Hungary um, and I'm majoring in architecture and urban design. Excited to be here. So um, I like to be organized, of course, when we go into uh, presentations. I consider myself a fairly organized person. So I wanted to talk to you about some of the things you can expect throughout this next hour presentation. So we're going to start with talking about Hamilton College. So some information about our college that you may or may not yet know. Um, and it gives you an idea of what type of uh, higher education institution Hamilton is, what type of opportunities we have, and also gives you an idea of where we're coming from when we pivot into the second portion of the presentation, which is going to be talking about applying to selective colleges in the United States. Now, uh, throughout the presentation, Lori is going to be sharing some of his experiences. So he's going to talk about some of his opportunities and things that he has pursued while at Hamilton. And then he's also going to talk about his process of applying to the United States, because I think you'd be interested to learn about some of the experiences he went through when he was applying to the United States, as he was at, sitting in a very similar position as you were just a few years ago. So. With that said, I'm going to pass the mic off to my colleague, Brenna, who is going to be talking about Hamilton College. All right, thanks so much, Anna. Um, so as Anna said, we are going to start with just a little bit about Hamilton to kind of ground you in who Hamilton is and what we are end up ultimately looking for in an applicant. Um, so we'd like to start with this slide, which is just a series of facts about Hamilton. So um, we were officially founded back in the late 1700s and then chartered as a college in 1812. So we are a, uh, we have a long history at Hamilton and we've been here a long time, um, but we are a small school. We only have 1,850 students, which for schools in the U.S. is really quite small. Um, we're located in central New York State. So if you are picturing a map of New York, we are right in the middle of that map and we're about four hours north from New York City. So if you're picturing New York City when you hear New York, that's going to be a little bit different than and what Hamilton has to offer. Um, so as I said, about four hours north of New York City, we're also about a four hour drive from both Boston and Toronto uh, to other major cities. We offer Bachelor of Arts degrees. Um, you'll be able to see the full list of degrees that we offer in a couple of minutes, um, but know that they are all bachelor's degrees. We have entirely undergraduate seeking students at Hamilton. Um, and in our student body, we have about 7% of our students who are international students and representing about 49 countries. So we do have students from all over the world, all different walks of life. Um, with our small size, we're able to keep our classes quite small. Our faculty to student ratio is nine to one, meaning that for every nine students, there's one faculty member. So you get to know them quite well. You get to be in these small classroom settings. Um, and then we also have a big commitment to supporting our students. Um, certainly financially is a big part of that. Um, you can see there that our total financial aid budget is $46 million per year. And we do, excuse me, we do give out financial aid to international students as well, which we'll talk a bit more about later. But that is a very important part of our process. 
We also have a big focus on undergraduate research. Being an undergraduate only institution, that means that all of the research opportunities are for undergraduates. You get to do that during your time seeking a bachelor's degree. And there's over, uh, over half a million dollars every year of a budget that goes towards uh, supporting those students. We are named after Alexander Hamilton. If you heard um, me and your advisors ch chatting for a few minutes before this started, you, we talked about the musical for a moment and Alexander Hamilton did sit on our original board of trustees at Hamilton. So we have that long history with him as well. And then finally, we like to include our motto, which is know thyself. We understand that knowing thyself is something that will take a whole lifetime to perfect and figure out, but we hope to let you uh, get there at least partly during your time at Hamilton. <laughs> So we also make a three-part Hamilton promise to our students. And the first of those parts is that you will study what you love while you're on campus. Of course, this is relating to academics, and you can see a few highlights here that I'll go through. Um, Hamilton does have over 50 areas of study on campus, and you'll see a list of those on the next slide when we go there. Um, but the most distinctive academic characteristic that we have is our open curriculum. Um, you may hear this at a couple of other colleges, but it is pretty unusual. Um, there's only a few colleges in the US that do it this way, and it means that we have no general education requirements. So while you're at Hamilton, you get to truly study what you love. You get to take classes that you really like taking without having to take classes that you're only in because of a requirement. We have great academic advising in place for students who need a little bit of extra support. We understand that the open curriculum can be a little scary, a little intimidating if you're not sure what you want to study, and that's why those academic advisors are there. Um, as I mentioned, we have over 50 areas of study on campus, and the, the few most popular ones that you'll see there is um, economics, math, a lot of STEM fields are popular, um, the performing arts and theater, really across the board is what our students are studying on campus. Because of the open curriculum, it's quite easy to have more than one area of study. 20% of our students double major. You can also have a major and a minor area of study or some other combination of those things. We do have a strong focus on writing, communication, and research. So although we don't really have true requirements, we do have our students take writing intensive courses. These are offered in every single discipline on campus. So you don't need to take a creative writing course if you don't want to take a course like that. You could take a writing intensive course in mathematics or in economics or really anything else that we offer. The focus is just to make you a better writer in whatever field that you would like to pursue. Same thing goes with communication and research. These aren't requirements on campus, but they're important parts of the Hamilton experience. And you'll see also that we have these centers for writing, oral communication, and quantitative and symbolic reasoning. These are academic resource centers that are there to support you if you need a little bit of extra help. So if you're coming into Hamilton and thinking, I've never given a presentation before, I've never done public speaking, or I'm not very good at math, I need a little bit of help with that, then the, these centers are there to help you with those kinds of things. And then again, going back to that idea of research, that is quite popular at Hamilton. Um, we have this big budget to support student research. Um, oftentimes that happens over the summer or sometimes during the academic year as well. And it can happen in every single division on campus. So I think research is often thought of as something that only happens in the sciences. And that is certainly an area that we have research on campus, but you can also do research in theater or um, English or humanities or really anything else. Um, so that is something that's quite popular and every single student does some kind of capstone thesis or project in order to graduate in their senior year. So every student will have an opportunity to do some kind of independent research. And then finally in academics, um, we, it is very popular to study abroad while you're at Hamilton. And we know that any of you coming to campus will already be studying abroad, but if you would like to do that one more time and go to another country, that is available. And about two thirds of our students will choose to do that while they're at Hamilton. We have locations all over the world, over a hundred of them in fact. We also have ones that are sponsored through Hamilton that are here in the US. So if you'd like to take a, a semester off campus and go to New York City or Washington Washington DC, that would count as studying abroad or studying off campus, and you'd be able to pursue an internship while you're in those programs. Um, so there's lots of different options, and that's quite popular for our students to do. 
So we won't stay on this slide for too long, but just to take a quick look at the all the things that we offer on campus, you can see that they really span a wide range. Um, you will see right in the middle there that interdisciplinary is bolded, and there's an important reason for that, because interdisciplinary at Hamilton is essentially being able to create your own program of study. And I know someone who could definitely talk about this, which is Lori, because he did it. <laughs> um, so Lori, if you want to share anything about what the process is of creating your own major, I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, definitely. So the interdisciplinary um, major, well, the name just means that your interests pretty much lie between departments or between fields of study and um, or over a couple of fields of study. And essentially, you don't want to, um, you know, just like have three majors or anything like that. So the college gives you the option to select courses from these departments and essentially create your own plan for a degree. And then you get to name that degree and submit this proposal to um, the college and then they will carefully review it. You also need to have an advisor. So a professor will help you along the way. Um, so it's really not a worrisome process at all. And in my experience and my friend's experience, um, someone who is planning to do an interdisciplinary concentration usually gets approved. And it's in general, just a really great opportunity. Definitely, thanks Lori. Um, Oh yeah, someone just asked, Lori, maybe if you want to add really quick, what's your academic background and like kind of what led you towards creating this major? Because yours is particularly unusual, I think. Yeah, so I am pretty much all over the place. And in high school, I thought I was going to go into literature. And then I thought I was going to go into government. Um, and when I came to Hamilton, I thought I was going to go into government. And then I took a course in urban planning, which really just kind of gave me a 180 that turned me towards um, architecture and urban design, which is my interdisciplinary major. And um, I see that um, there are more questions coming in. So I went to a public school and um, I went there for four years and it wasn't anything too special, I would say. <laughs> And Lori's also going to talk a little bit about this process in just, in just a bit, so um, stay tuned. <laughs> Thanks, Lori. <laughs> I think we can go, to, yeah, there we go. So I mentioned the three-part Hamilton promise that we make to our students. We've talked about the first part, which is study what you love. And now the second part is be who you are. And this is more about what it's like to be a student on campus. Obviously, Lori will be able to talk about this as well since he is a student on our campus, but just for a little bit of an overview. Um, a little bit more about the student body. I mentioned before that we have 49 countries represented. We also have 47 states in the US. So we really have students from all over. 16% of our students are the first in their families to attend college and then about 50% of students receive financial aid. So we have students who are from all walks of life and that type of diversity is very important to us, um, especially because 100% of students live on campus for all four years. So other than being with students in the classroom, you're also learning from each other in the res halls, in the dining halls, and in every place on campus. Um, with everyone on campus for all four years, there's always a lot going on. It's very difficult to get bored. We have over 200 student organizations on campus, ranging everywhere from uh, club athletics to Greek life to international student associations to other cultural groups, uh, performing arts, you know, really everything that you can think of, you can get involved in while you're at Hamilton. It's also very easy to try something new. And I think a lot of our students take advantage of that because maybe when you were at home, you didn't have the opportunity to learn how to speak Chinese, <laughs> but that's something that you can do while you're at Hamilton. And students are really willing to take advantage of those opportunities. Um, we also, again, going back to living on campus for all four years, it's uh, something that's important to our identity is that we are a residential college and we have 26 different residence halls on campus. This is a very large number for a school of our size and it means that they're all really different. Um, some of them are really small, some of them are bigger, some of them are substance free for first year students, some of them are first year students only or, or close to only. Um, so there's just a large variety of types of residence halls that you could live in. Uh, and in terms of where we're located, I mentioned before that we're in that rural part of New York, um, and we're pretty close to the Adirondack Mountain Range as well, which is a large state park in New York. Um, so if you do like to ski or hike or camp, or you've never done any of those things, but you want to try them, they're all very accessible from campus. 
Um, and then at the bottom, you can see that we are a Division Three athletic school, meaning that we have athletics on campus, we have teams that compete against other colleges, but it's not at the most highly competitive level that you'll see in the US. So there is the, the Division One schools where you might see them on television playing uh, their sports or, you know, just a really, really big athletic culture on campus. And Hamilton's not quite like that. There is a better balance between being an athlete and being a student, but we also do have sports. So if you want to be a spectator, if you want to play a sport, those are absolutely accessible. We have strong arts and theater programs as well. So if you're more interested in uh, doing some performing or if you want to do sports and performance, that's also pretty common. Students do a cool combination of things. And then there's just a couple of examples of some international student support services that we have. We have a great international students association, international friendship program, and there's also a peer mentoring program for students when they come in as first year students. And then finally, the third part of our promise is that you will find your future at Hamilton. Um, so this is talking a little bit about what happens after graduation. How do we how do we prepare our students for life after Hamilton? And this really starts with our career center. Our career center is very involved with students while they're at Hamilton. They're really engaged with what students are going through. And every single student has a career guide or advisor who is someone who you'll meet with for all four years that you're at Hamilton. So rather than being someone who you meet for the first time as a senior. This is someone who you've known for four years who can uh, advise you really well because they know you better. We do also have pre-professional advising in place. So if you're someone who's interested in going to law school or business school or becoming an engineer, these are things that we have advisors for on campus. So even though we don't have an engineering major, you could still pursue that at Hamilton with the help of this advisor and then go on to do a degree after Hamilton. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Um, we always say that the liberal arts and the open curriculum produce students who are just great critical thinkers, great problem solvers, great communicators, because that's something that's important to us. Um, so a lot of students um, think that, oh, I have to major in engineering, I have to major in business, I have to major in what exactly what I'm going to do after graduation. And that is just not always the case. I'm a, I'm a product of a liberal arts school, although I didn't go to Hamilton, and I was a double theater and mathematics major with a minor in German and now I work in education. <laughs> so although I learned lots of skills that are really important to me now in my professional career, I didn't major in education and that's okay. You can still learn the skills that you need in order to go on to a career that you want to do. Our alumni network is also really important to our career services process. They're very generous with their time and their resources and their networking contacts. So a lot of our internship opportunities come through that alumni network. So if you're looking for an internship, you might be able to find one because of an alumni contact that we have. Um, and we do have some pretty cool famous alums as well. We have Pulitzer Prize winners. The, one of the co-founders of Netflix is a Hamilton alum, the current CEO of Goldman Sachs in New York City. So these types of people of course are great contacts for our students if they're looking to go into those fields. And then you can see just a few statistics down there at the bottom that our students are very successful after graduation. We have a 97% placement rate within 10 months. That means that within 10 months of graduation, 97% of our students are either working in grad school or doing some kind of fellowship. That's a pretty high placement rate. Our students are very successful. Um, and say the same number, 97% of students graduate with at least one internship experience. So some kind of hands-on full-time work experience that you're able to then take into your professional career. Um, we also have a lot of services through our career center like mock interviews or learning how to write a resume, things like that. So 81% of students have had two interviews, a mock, mock or otherwise, before graduating. So those kinds of resources are very accessible at Hamilton um, and just very easy for our students to get on their feet after graduation. And then finally, um, we'll obviously talk a lot more about the admission process in a few minutes, but just to highlight Hamilton's financial aid promise as well, we want to make Hamilton as affordable to as many students as we can. Um, so we do guarantee to meet 100% of the demonstrated financial need for all accepted students, including international students. Um, this means that we don't have any merit-based scholarships, and we also don't have any athletic scholarships. Everything is need-based financial aid. A lot of people ask us why we do it that way, and the re real reason is because we want it to be accessible and we want to afford opportunities to a lot of students. So it's an issue of access and opportunity for us, and that's something that's important to us. 
We have a $4 million annual budget financial aid for international students. So there are resources there for us to help you. And we also have cost calculators on the website. So if you want to take a look at those, it should be able to give you a rough estimate of what Hamilton might cost for you and your family. And now I mean, we're going to turn it over to Lori a little bit. You've heard a little bit from him already, um, but Lori, if you want to talk a little bit more just about what you do on campus, what your experiences have been, et cetera. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Really wish that guy looks like the guy in the picture, but um, <laughs> either way. So this is me. And um, as I said before, I'm from Hungary. I'm from the south of it. And um, I'm in the class of 2022, which means that's the year I will graduate. So I finished two years of my program and there are two years left and I'm entering my junior year this fall. Um, I have worked with Education USA in Hungary. So as a student at first, as a client, and then um, after graduating high school, I worked with them for a year um, as somewhat of a, um, well, I liked calling myself a junior educational advisor, but that sounds too fancy for um, what I was doing. But essentially I was a helping hand um, in the office and I was helping other students um, realize their plans of coming to the US. So I've seen it, um, you know, what you guys are doing from the Education USA side and now I'm working in admissions here on campus. So I'm kind of also getting a little glimpse into um, the perspective from the other side of uh, the process. And as we've talked about it, uh, I'm doing an interdisciplinary concentration in architecture and urban design. So that combines classes from um, departments like art history, history, art, as well as um, a study abroad program in Denmark. I can talk about that later as well, especially if there's interest. And then I am doing a lot of things on campus. So um, this is a selection of my extracurriculars. Uh, besides working in admissions, I also work in one of the dining halls. And as you can see, I was a community service intern, um, which was also um, a job. It was a two-year internship um, off campus. And then uh, I'm on the figure skating team. I was the captain of the team this past semester. Um, I started the uh, Society of Urban Planners and Architects, which is essentially our architecture club on campus. And uh, I also lead the Arabic and Middle East organization, um, which is a language and culture um, based club. You guys already heard that we have many, many clubs. So you can see kind of a selection of it. I'm also part of um, a native activism group on campus, native rights activism group, um, and many other things. Uh, <laughs> so I wouldn't want to uh, take up too much time with that. I also can never really remember the full list of the things that I do. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's always trying to put things on one slide when it's you're so involved in everything and then not to mention remembering things and do you have to alphabetize them or I imagine there's a very specific scheduling process that's pretty re <laughs> regimented for you to be able to follow all of that. But you'll find um, that Lori's experience um, as being hyper engaged in our community is really a hallmark of a lot of Hamilton students and of course uh, Lori is a great example of that and he's going to be talking a little bit more about his application process in just a little bit. Um, but we want to take a step back now and consider uh, applying to the U.S. in general. So the information we've given to this point has been specific to Hamilton College, uh, whereas now we're going to talk a little bit more about applying to selective colleges in the United States and some advice that we would have for international students who are in your situation. So the first thing is to understand what type of admission application review do uh, U.S. universities and colleges that are selective institutions uh, follow. We follow what's called a holistic application review and this can be challenging for students to understand if they come from an education system that is based solely on examination or academic uh, bench, uh, benchmarks where if you receive such a score in such a percentile nationally then you have opportunities to study at these specific universities. Whereas in the United States oftentimes we will have several students many students, more students who would be academically uh, successful potentially at our colleges um, then we have specific spaces. We've said earlier that Hamilton has just under 2,000 students, so we have a limited space capacity. So we need to make sure that when we bring students to campus, yes, are they going to be academically uh, successful, but we also are interested in knowing uh, what type of contributors would they be to our community. So Brenna was talking about the fact that we are 100% residential before, and Lori was talking about some of his many different ways that he's involved 
in the community. So when we look at an application process, we are interested in how are you going to be a contributor to our community, which is one of the ways we want to get to know you as a person. The other way you can think about it is if you have some examinations from your secondary school, um, that doesn't make I set up this. So um, basically, people are more than examination results, right? People are people and they're complicated. There's multi, multiple aspects that make you you. So in our admissions process, we want to try and get to know you as a person a little more and also to get to understand how would you be a contributor to our community if we were to offer you admission at our institutions. So for that, we use a holistic application review, which looks at both academic and non-academic aspects. Now, there are a lot of benefits to the uh, holistic application review. The first is that it's not regimented. So there are no cutoffs, um, no specific minimum requirements for academics or test, score, test scores. Instead, we consider your application as a whole and that there will be different strengths for different types of people, as again, every person is slightly different. Now, the holistic application review also allows for the consideration of context. Context can be a confusing type of term, but what we mean about context is Students have different opportunities when they're in high school, when they're uh, growing up, and students have different interests and different uh, challenges they may overcome. So context means um, what type of academic environment did you come from? Did you have opportunities to uh, challenge yourself within the curriculum? Or was your curriculum really standardized where everyone took the same courses? Context could also be extracurricular activities. So some students are involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. Other students might have family responsibilities or um, have a job outside of classroom that takes time away from their time spent doing ex traditional extracurricular activities. So this allows us to understand uh, what opportunities did you have and what types of challenges did you overcome as part of your studies, which then allows us to again in imagine what type of a contributor would you be to our on campus community environment. Now, one of the benefits for using holistic review is that it allows us to create a well rounded community. We have some students who are interested in, in athletic work, some students who are interested in theater, a lot of students who are interested in a lot of different subjects, but it allows us to make sure that the students that come to our campus have different perspectives and different interests, and this really elevates the level of discussion, dialogue, and learning on our campus environment. So when you're thinking about navigating a holistic application review, let's talk about a couple of pointers, some do's and don'ts, good advice um, for students to use when you're applying both to Hamilton and to other colleges in the United States. So the first is you need to, of course, research and adhere to all of the requirements and deadlines. So while we're going to talk about some general information, it's important to know that U.S. universities and colleges will have slight variations on these themes. So you as an applicant, you have the responsibility to make sure you know what does a specific university or college require and when do they require it? Because you need, if you are not able to submit all of the documents that are required in a timely fashion, you will not get a positive result from that college or university. Now, um, so the first thing you want to do is when you're creating your list of colleges where you're going to apply, you need to make sure you're organized and you know what is required by each college. Does this college have an additional supplement? Does this college have an earlier deadline? And making sure you're meeting those expectations. The second is you want to take advantage of opportunities for engagement. So today you're actually engaging with a couple of admission officers at Hamilton College um, but different admission offices across the United States are available for you to reach out with meaningful questions and interactions and engagement opportunities. So uh, right now, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, colleges and universities across the United States are really um, increasing their opportunities for virtual engagement with their offices. These could be virtual information sessions, these could be interviews, lots of opportunities for you to connect with colleges, which can be really helpful to learn uh, specific uh, interests that the college has, both in applicants, it can also let the college get to know you and get you the opportunity to get to know more about the college. So engagement, meaningful engagement with admission officers is a good idea. It's also important to consider your application in its totality. In the United States, we have a saying which says, uh, you miss the forest beca uh, because of the trees. The idea being that you focus all of your time and energy on the essay, or you focus all of your time and energy on testing, or all of your time and energy on your uh, extracurricular activities. Whereas it's important to think about the overall uh, application that you're submitting. As admission officers are going to review everything that you sent to us, you want to think about your application in its totality. Is it saying, what does it say about you? Is it representing you accurately? But of course you on a good day, right? So it wants to be you on a good day. Another way of thinking about this is thinking about the voice 
Now, when you apply to the United States to college, you'll get a lot of advice from a lot of people. Everybody has advice, right? But it's important when you're putting your application together, the application should reflect you and your essay should reflect you. One of the uh, examples that we like to uh, share with students is if someone was to find your application or your essay sitting in a hallway without your name on it, would your friends and family be able to say, yes, this sounds like Lori, or yes, this sounds like Brenna? Is it accurate to your voice? So you wanna think about that way because then it's also going to show the college a good depiction of who you are as a person. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about different application rounds, early decision versus regular decision. These can be useful tools for you in the admission process. Um, Lori can talk also about some of the way he utilized different application rounds in his admission process. But this is an important tool to understand a different, a, a specific college. So for instance, Hamilton, we have uh, three different application rounds, early decision one, early decision two, and regular decision. And these have different deadlines. So it's important to know why do these exist and what are the benefits of different rounds because they can help you navigate the application process. And finally, it's also important to ask meaningful questions. So we, have, we spend a lot of time, an exhaustive amount of time, trying to anticipate your questions and updating our website with information that we think is important for you to know. That said, we don't get everything right and every person is different, which means that sometimes you'll have a question you don't find answered, the answer on our website. In this situation, it's a good idea to engage with the admission office um, in order to ask that question. So if you have meaningful questions that are not referenced on the website, um, this can be a great opportunity for you to engage with an admission office. Now, most admission offices in the United States will actually have a listing on their website that says, these are the admission officers who are responsible, particularly for international students. So you can find their names and their email addresses, all very accessible through the website. Another question that you can sometimes ask them is if you would like to engage with a student, um, admission officers can oftentimes put you in contact with a current student who can answer questions for you. Some things not to do. Um, so when you submit your application to the United States, there will be a section where we ask you for extracurricular activities. Some students feel they must use every single slot on the extracurricular activities list because otherwise it looks like they are not busy, things like that. Extracurricular activities should really only be uh, used if it's something that's important to you, if you've already had a prolonged experience with it. Maybe, again, this could be you've been involved with Model UN. Maybe this could be you've been involved with um, theater. Maybe you have a job. Maybe you have family responsibilities. But you should not feel the need to fill every single slot just because it's there. The second is um, some students will feel the need to send a lot of letters of recommendation. So at Hamilton, we only uh, need uh, two, and we sometimes will suggest three letters of recommendation for students who apply. If you send more than five, it is excessive and unnecessary. I know we've had some students who've sent over 40 letters of recommendation. At that point, I would just think, I don't think 40 people know me enough to write a letter of recommendation. So this person must be very busy talking with everybody all the time. Uh, limit it to under five, usually, if a college is only asking you for a certain amount of letters of recommendation, over five will not be helpful. Um, when you're writing, writing your letter, your essay, um, some students will put the name of a college in the essay. And the problem with that is what happens then? You accidentally send the ring, wrong name of the wrong college to the wrong institution when you're applying, right? So sometimes Brenna and I will be reading application essays. And the application essay sounds great, but then at the end it says, and that is why I wish to attend Smith College. Okay, um, so this person it wants to go to Smith, why are they applying to Hamilton? So in order to avoid this um, mistake, which happens quite commonly, maybe just don't put the name of a college in your application essay. And finally, uh, don't wait until the deadline. So we all know if you wait until the deadline, what happens? Your computer crashes, you lose the most recent draft of an essay, things go wrong when we wait until the deadline, right? So it's important to think, what is the deadline? And think to yourself, okay, I am going to submit one week previous, one week prior to the deadline. That way, if something goes wrong, I have time to adjust. Now, some aspects of an application that I want to talk about a little bit. The first is testing. This is something that stresses a lot of students quite substantially. It's important to know in order to apply to the United States, there are two types of testing. The one would be an academic-based test. This might be the SAT or the ACT. The other would be an English proficiency test. Now, in response to COVID-19, almost every university in the United States right now is test optional for the SAT or ACT test. However, usually they are not test optional for English proficiency. The reason for that is that you have a variety of ways that you can prove English proficiency. 
including online options, including low cost options. There are oftentimes fee waivers available for this. And it's really important if we admit you to our college um, that we know that you're going to have the English level in order to be successful. Brenna mentioned how important writing and communication is at Hamilton. So all of our courses are, uh, have, require a very high level of English understanding. So we are not going to be test optional for English scores. We are going to be test optional for SAT or ACT. Now the question students follow up with, okay, are you really test optional? <laughs> yes, we really will be admitting students with testing and we will be admitting students without testing. And at Hamilton, we are not going to have additional requirements for students who don't have testing. Um, however, some colleges may. So you must make sure that you're researching if you're going to be going the test optional route, is there an additional requirement that, that college has? Now Hamilton is going to, as I said, we're not going to have an additional requirement to compensate for testing. Instead, we have always used this holistic application approach, which means we're considering all of the elements of your application before we make a decision. We're going to be doing so this year. That will not change. However, it is also important to note that for all colleges around the United States, the most important part of your application is going to be your academic results, mark sheets, and exams. So uh, those, along with the other aspects of your application, will be what we will use to make our decision. So if you have testing, you might think, okay, so should I send testing or not? And of course, this is a student independent decision which you should make in consultation, uh, maybe with support from an Education USA advisor who can be a great resource. Um, but this is a personal choice. If you want to get some idea of previous testing uh, ranges that schools have admitted, you can go online and you can oftentimes find the class profile for students who were admitted in the past year. And you can think, is my testing similar to this? And also, does, do I feel like my testing is a strong representation of my academic ability? And that can help you make the decision whether to send testing or not. But I can assure you, at Hamilton, we will be admitting students without testing, so we are truly test optional. Okay, moving to the other part of the application that tends to stress people out, which is your college essay, right? Now, colleges in the United States require an essay in order to apply. So some advice that we have for you, do consider the voice. Remember, does this sound like you? If I found your essay in a hallway and didn't have your name, would somebody be able to say, this sounds like Lori? Um, second is we want to say, do you uh, topic of the essay should show your action. We want to emphasize some type of progression and growth that you've had through with the topic, whatever the topic is that you've selected to write about. We also then want to consider the overall application. Remember, you want to see the forest, not just the trees. So if you think about something that's important to you um, that is not yet reflected in other elements of your application, that can be a great topic for you to use your essay for. So make sure that your essay is compl complementing and enhancing the other aspects of your application. Now it's also important that you want to do multiple drafts. Nobody writes a perfect essay the first time. So you want to do editing, you want to do multiple drafts, and sometimes it can be helpful to get additional advice. I know Education USA can also offer advice in essay writing. Um, you also want to remember the audience. So the people who are going to read it are people like Brenna and myself, which means whatever topic that you choose, make sure it's appropriate for an admission officer um, to read. And then if a college gives you an opportunity to submit a supplemental essay, it's a good idea to consider uh, su uh, submitting that supplemental essay because it shows the college that you're serious and interested in that college specifically. Now, some things not to do. Sometimes Brenna and I will read essays and they start by saying, oh, it was a moonlit night and there was wind ri uh, rippling through the trees and the wa water and the lake and the sh moonlight. And all of that is very narrative and very lovely, but tells us nothing about you. So it's important to not just describe things narratively, you should be focused on action for yourself as opposed to describing everything around you. Now, the second is, of course, don't overstress. This is a stressful process. Applying to the United States is stressful. We're not going to be giving up Pulitzer Prizes, and we also assume that you will have room to grow as a writer throughout your academic studies. If you're already a perfect Pulitzer Prize winning writer, why do you need to go to college, right? You're already done. So it's important, don't stress. We don't expect everything to be perfect, but we do um, encourage uh, drafts and making sure you're as close as possible to grammatically accurate. Um, do not write an essay based on what you think the college wants to hear. If somebody says, oh, this is what you should write on. Again, the essay should be something unique to you. That's real to you, sounds like you. Don't reference a specific institution. We said that earlier, problems and uh, mistakes, mistakes happen. And also don't exceed the word count. If the college says, this is how long your essay should be, don't think, oh, well, I have just so much to say. They'll wanna hear twice the word count that they asked for. 
make sure that you're uh, staying within the parameters that are given to you. Now, a checklist that you can consider. Is the essay interesting? Does it show who you are? Is it something that's important to you? Does it convey how you think? Is the presentation neat, logical, clearly stated? Is there a good transition between separate ideas? Did you uh, stick with the directions regarding length? Did you proofread? Are your writing me mechanics uh, accurate? Is there a conclusion rather than just ending with a summary of what you've previously said? And does it sound like you? Now, if you want additional exa examples of uh, essay advice, Hamilton publishes a section on our website called The Seven Deadly Sins of Writing, which is basically some of the pet peeves that some admission officers and faculty members across the campus have about people who make writing errors, so you can avoid some of those errors. We also have an example on our website called Essays That Worked, which are examples of essays written from students who were admitted to Hamilton. So you can get some inspiration from those. Those will be available through our website. Application times. As I mentioned earlier, Hamilton has a few different application rounds. The first is early decision. Early decision, we have two early decision plans, uh, November 15th and January 1st. That's early decision one and early decision two, or as we say, early decision for those of us with a procrastination situation. Uh, the important thing about early decision is that this is a binding plan. So if you have decided Hamilton is definitely the top choice for me, uh, you can apply early decision. And that would say, if you admit me to Hamilton College, I promise to withdraw my other applications to other colleges and universities. And you have two different early decision rounds. Remember, uh, November 15th and January 1st. And most selective colleges in the United States will have this plan. Now we also have regular decision, which is also on January 1st and is non-binding. So this means I'm interested in Hamilton College, but I'm not yet completely uh, sure that that's my top choice. You might think, why would I apply to something that is binding if I could apply to an open or, uh, regular decision plan? The important thing to realize is the admission rates are traditionally higher for students who apply in the early decision round, as it is considered a way of you demonstrating to the college that you're passionate about attending that school and you're really, really sure that Hamilton is a great choice for you, the admission rates will oftentimes be uh, substantially higher for students to apply early decision. So we will admit students in regular decision, but it becomes more competitive. So this means if you have a college or university that is your top choice, it can be advisable to consider submitting an early decision application. Sometimes you may hear the word early action it's important to realize they sound, sound similar to early decision. Early action just means you wanna submit your application earlier and you wanna receive your admission decision earlier. Early action is not binding, but if you hear the word decision, that is binding. Okay, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, Lori's application process and some advice he would give. Um, yeah, so my application story is pretty long, but it's, I'm assuming pretty interesting, so <laughs> bear with me. Um, <clears throat> so I um, graduated high school in 2017, and that's when I applied to colleges. And as you could see, the deadlines and the whole timeline of applications in the U.S. tends to be um, a lot different than um, at least it was for me in Hungary. So um, you kind of have to prepare in advance. So it's a really great thing that you guys are here and that you are listening to us and we talked about engagement. And this is a very great first step for you to listen to this story, um, listen to what the admission officers have to say. Um, and I also did some of that. So when I um, was applying, I made sure to stay in contact with the colleges I was interested in and be you know, very on top of the different deadlines and requirements. So, my, so in 2017, I applied to five colleges and um, one of them was Hamilton. And I was in a very, very interesting situation where I ended up being rejected from every single one of them, which I honestly thought was not in the book. I thought it was not an option um, that could happen, but it can. And um, I was really surprised because I've been preparing for the past four years, you know, and, and I've been um, you know, spending a lot of time practicing for the SATs, for TOEFL, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, that kind of made me think about all of those questions that Anna just outlined to you guys about essays and kind of, you know, where I could have gone wrong, what I could have done, um, you know, in addition to um, essays and all of that. So I also did interviews for the second year that I, I applied. So I, I essentially took a gap year. Um, and through that gap year, I kind of uh, reevaluated um, uh, what I did, what I didn't do, um, what I could have done more of or less of. And um, 
uh, kind of thinking about that, I rewrote my essay and um, I also reached out to colleges and, and asked for interviews, which can be a really great thing if you're someone who's very expressive in person, uh, but maybe not so expressive in writing. So, um, and I, and I um, decided to put Hamilton as uh, my early decision. So I, I really liked the way that they stayed in touch with me even when I was waitlisted and just um, their attitude towards me as a prospective student. It was um, really refreshing to see and um, you all can see that I have an accent in my name and surprisingly of the five colleges that I applied to, only Hamilton um, spelled my name correctly. Other, um, um, other colleges would just put a question mark there or a weird combination of uh, symbols and uh, I know some of our viewers you also have accents in your name um, so you know that that can be a, um, a little disturbing when a caller sends you an email and they can't even spell your name right um, so I decided to put Hamilton as my first choice and to kind of communicate that to the college I um, applied early decision and um, that second cycle that I did um, uh, for college applications um, Hamilton was actually my only um, application because I ended up getting accepted so I did not uh, finish my other applications at all um, and if you guys have any questions about the story that I'm telling or anything like that make sure to send them in the chat box because I'm really just kind of saying anything that comes up um, so if, if you have specific questions please let me know um, also it's very weird to look at my face uh, for this long on the screen <laughs> <laughs> um, but so let's talk about some advice that I received. So probably the biggest advice and one that was um, that I was told constantly um, was to just stay in contact with the colleges that you're applying to and um, kind of, um, well, if I say develop a personal relationship, that sounds a little bit too much, but um, develop a relationship with the college, you know, know the people who are uh, responsible for international recruitment and um, and make sure that all your questions are answered reach out to them whenever you are unsure um, because this is a confusing process and if you don't ask questions you're not going to get answers um, so um, so that was probably the biggest piece of advice uh, for me uh, that I received through education USA so you know I was following my colleges on social media I um, checked in with them every once in a while. I made sure that they received my recommendation letters. I um, you know, made sure that um, I completed everything on my checklist that they were asking for. And um, um, uh, you know, if you wanna ask for an interview, sometimes colleges might not have that option up on their website. Um, I know we do, but you can always email a college and ask for an uh, interview. And um, uh, in my experience, they will arrange that for you. So again, if you're someone whose um, personality, um, uh, you know, strongly relies on your, um, uh, on your personal expression, that can be a really great resource for you. Um, and then this is kind of similar to the advice that I, I would offer you. So I would just pass this on to you guys. Um, and um, some, some, let me, let me think this through, because uh, you, you just saw a lot of things on the slides and I saw them too. And I, I did have a couple thoughts about what was said. Um, I mean, obviously you guys will have access to this uh, recording, so you can always look at um, the do's and don'ts that you've seen, and I can agree with all of them. Uh, I feel like when um, 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 international students are applying to colleges in the US, one big, I wouldn't call it a mistake, but um, misconception is that, um, you hear you know, all the talk about like the holistic review and everything that you can put into your application. And that usually um, gets people thinking, oh my goodness, now I really have to impress people. And um, it doesn't matter if my SATs were good, now I really have to show that I'm you know, like a worthy human being. You're a worthy human being. Like you don't have to show that to a college. Um, so you know, your essay doesn't have to be about how you work together with the fire department in your town and you're the person who's responsible for I don't know saving the puppies from burning buildings and so far you rescued like 432 um, so that's like you don't have to be a hero okay and again if uh, I, I I usually suspect that if um, uh, someone writes an essay about being a hero 
And again, if they find it in a hallway, would your family be like, yep, my son is definitely a hero like that. Or, <laughs> you know, my friend is definitely that hero that um, he says he is. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of good to catch yourself a little bit um, before you get into that. So don't feel the pressure about that. And we started this presentation by saying, know thyself, know yourself. It can be really, really hard to do that. But try and be yourself in your essays and your extracurriculars so you don't need to take up um, volunteering if um, you don't necessarily want to um, you can just you know keep doing a job if you have one or keep you know uh, doing your family responsibilities it really doesn't have to be that impressive we just want to get to know you um, and again that's what is going to set you apart from other colleges um, you know, if you, if you can put in your um, essay that you want to go to Smith College, you can also put very specific information and stories about your past um, that will, you know, just kind of make admission officers remember you the same way that they might remember you if you um, <laughs> submit your Smith College essay to Hamilton. Um, yeah, so I don't, I'm trying to think of more advice that I had, and I guess one that I give to any student um, when they visit campus, regardless of if they're international or not, is just, um, you know, coming to um, a college in the US, you're thousands of miles away from home, so you have to put a lot of thought into it. And when you interact with colleges, look for signs of care and how those places will care about you once you get there and how they care about you as you're applying. Because you're gonna be, again, on the, on the complete other end of the world, from your family, from your friends. So if you need help or if you need to rely on someone, will that college be able to help you and will they accommodate any type of circumstance that you are in? So I know that can be really hard to look for and you know, I'm saying this and it sounds like, you know, it makes sense, but then like, how do I look for that? And, and I already told you the story about the accent. So that's just one little thing, you know, paying that much attention to take the two seconds to literally find that key on your phone or on your keyboard or anything like that. And I'll, I promise you it's there, even though people say it's not, but it is. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's a little sign of caring or, um, you know, just kind of seeing, uh, you know, what kind of living arrangement will you have on campus? I, I cannot imagine the dread of trying to find your own housing as an international student, you know, not understanding anything about the US coming here. I, I wouldn't have known how to find like an apartment and what's a reasonable price for an apartment or, or you know, any type of insurance or, or, or travel or anything like that. So, you know, your college kind of preparing to provide you with some of these and, and set these up for you can, again, be just a really big sign of how much they care about you. And you're gonna be, I, I cannot stress this enough. You're gonna be away from home and you will need people to rely on. So make sure that you go to a place where you, you know, you don't have an experience where you just get there and you're like, oh, so I guess I don't have a room to live in. And they forgot to tell me that. And now I'm hanging out in the student center for the next three months or something like that. Um, and I, I just, someone just asked a question. I think that's, I think that's a great, um, just in interest of time i'm sorry we're coming up towards the end yeah. of the time frame so let's keep this we'll come back to that question as the first question in the question and answer section but i think that's great advice uh to pivot just to the last slide which we have which is about our selection process at hamilton i'm going to ask brenna to take that slide over absolutely um so a lot of this on kind of went over in a more general sense of what a lot of colleges do and hamilton does do a lot of similar things to other colleges in the u.s so um we'll you'll see that we absolutely do a holistic review process um we consider all different aspects academic social we will be test optional except for the test of english proficiency all those things on touched on are true for hamilton in, in this next application cycle you can see our application types there remember that early decision means binding so if you know Hamilton's the place for you, that might be a good way to go. If you don't know Hamilton's the place for you, highly recommend not applying ED because then you will be attending Hamilton if you're accepted. Then um, regular decision is that other, that other option. 
And then we also have a lot of opportunities for virtual engagement with Hamilton right now. Um, you can do some virtual visits with us. Like I'm actually doing the virtual information session later today. So if you really want to hear me talk some more, you can register for that. Um, that's And oh yeah, Lori will be in the Continental chat later as well. Um, so these are just things that you can register for on our website. Um, we, ha we offer these particular ones Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday uh, every week. So you can come in and hang out with us and learn some more. Um, we also have virtual interviews as Lori mentioned uh, we don't typically have this many virtual interviews so this is definitely a silver lining of the pandemic that we've been able to offer so many so if you are a rising senior in high school right now and you want to show your interest in Hamilton that is one of the easiest and best ways to do it um, we also offer students the opportunity to submit an additional writing supplement or a personal website after you submit your application so if you've applied to Hamilton and you want to show more interest those are other ways you can do it um, and then I also got a question um, during the, the other part of this that I want to touch on now, and Anna, I think I'll ask you to touch on it as well. Um, we, we were asked to talk about what it looks like when we read applications, like do we drink coffee, do we take breaks, like we, the students, so the students can picture us reading. Um, so I'll start and say that we do typically read from our homes. So I, I'm currently in my home office, which is like a part of my little part corner of my house. Anna's in her home office too. Um, and at Hamilton, we actually read in pairs. So we read every single application with two people. Um, Anna and I often read together because of the international connection. Um, so every single application we get will be reviewed by at least two people, usually much more than that. Um, so I will be sitting at my home desk, which I'm at right now, and I'll probably be on Zoom with my reading partner, like Anna, um, and we'll be reading an application together, and then we'll get to talk about it, and we'll take notes. Um, I do typically have coffee, I have coffee right now, <laughs> um, and we definitely take breaks. Um, you know, we have certain uh, guidelines. We want to we want to read a certain number of applications per day so that we can get them all done. But we also want to make sure that we're giving the uh, appropriate attention to every application as well. So we're going. You know, if we read ten applications, then we might take a break for five minutes just to stretch and reinvigorate our minds and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of what it looks like. Sometimes I'll have my cat jump up on my lap or jump up on the desk. <laughs> I think the important thing to add to that is the fact that we recognize you are human being and you're more than just your test results. So we also, we are also human beings. So um, each of us has a slightly different reading style. Um, but what we, we have a few mantras that we make sure we're following. The first is that the first application we read of the day receives the same attention as the last application we read of the day. So um, we make sure that every single application that we, re we review, we're reading everything, all of the content that you send to us. So we know you've put a lot of energy and a lot of effort into making your application stand out, and we want to give you that attention and energy back. So one of the reasons that we have two people read through the application uh, with the first review process is so that we can make sure that we are not missing different aspects. We have two sets of eyes. We talk about each applicant. Um, how do we feel about different aspects of the application? We take very serious notes. And for most students, there will be at least four or five people who are reviewing each application before a decision is officially uh, designed and approved. So we assure you that each of us is a different human being. So we have slight variations on the way we read. However, um, each application is given the same care and attention that we know you've given into submitting that application. And it also means, remember, when we're reading your application, remember who's reading it, it's admission officers. So we are human beings, but make sure it's an admission officer appropriate content that you're sending to us. Um, so then I think we had, we had a question which was uh, submitted to Lori which was, uh, why do you think you were admitted and what makes you a good match with Hamilton? So that's a big question for the uh, know thyself. So what do you think? <laughs> um, yeah, no, I honestly, um, first of all, when you're applying to colleges, I don't think that's a question that you should ever ask yourself um, or why you weren't admitted or anything like that because you will never know. Um, I don't think you will ever know. There's just so much that goes into applications. And again, we talked about how there's no cutoff line. So, you know, it's not like, oh, your SATs were too bad. So that's why you didn't come to this college or you passed this bar and now you're studying here. And usually when people ask me this, I just tell kind of like a, um, a, a reasoning that people gave me um, for how Hamilton's admission process works. And I don't actually remember who told me this but I feel like it's just such a nice um, view and perspective. So when you wanna kind of think about um, how Hamilton or how it is different 
from other colleges. So what they told me was that uh, when Hamilton admits students, again, there's like no bar that you have to pass or there's no like limit um, uh, that you have to reach. But instead, Hamilton is thinking about kind of accepting the whole class at the same time. So thinking about, you know, how are we going to bring a community to this campus? And how will this person be part of that community? And an easy way to think about it is you um, imagine a jigsaw puzzle and you're one of the pieces in there and the whole puzzle is the class. And you know, if you, if you show us your puzzle piece, if you let us know who you are, if you, you know, kind of, again, know thyself, um, if you um, show us who you are, we can you know, think about how will this puzzle piece, how will this student fit into the class? How will it connect to a roommate? How will it connect to um, a department? How will it connect to um, the international community or maybe you know, a community of color or really depending on your identity and where you are coming from or how you will fit in um, religiously if you um, are religious or anything like that. And, and, you know, when we see that, when we see your puzzle piece, we will be able to fit that in. And then when the whole class comes here, there's this, uh, and, and, you know, you live on campus all four years, which we talked about, and uh, you take classes just because you love them. So you'll see people all the time from so many different um, uh, walks of life and so many different um, communities on campus. Uh, and it really just kind of reinforces this um, I'm not going to say unity because that's, I feel like that's an overused term, but really, you know, the community that's here it, is really reinforced by these policies and really just thinking about it this way. Um, so I think um, the reason I was not admitted the first year was because my puzzle piece did not fit into the class of 21. And then my, and then my puzzle piece fit perfectly in the class of 22. And I always thought, and I think this is what proves that this story is, or this allegory is, is true is that when I, when I came here, I thought, oh boy, I'm really gonna feel like, you know, um, I should have been in the class of 21 and I'm gonna, you know, feel kind of left out or um, I feel like everyone I meet, I'm gonna uh, say, well, you know, I, I should have been like, I could have been a junior technically, but da, da, da. I never had to have that conversation with anyone. I, I never say that. And I never felt like I was not a part of the class of 22. And I never felt like I should have been a part of the class of 21. So again, that's the class above me. Um, so that's, that, that would be my short answer um, to that question. And um, I think there's a lot of good matches to Hamilton. Uh, we just, we just want to see who you are and we just want to know who you are. I think that's really, really great advice. When we have um, one last, we have one last question. I think we, uh, we are already running a little bit over at this point. Um, so let's maybe have this the final question and we'll say a lot of thank yous. Yeah. Um, hi, Nicola. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, <laughs> so um, during my gap year, I um, honestly, at first I had no idea what to do. And then I um, got an offer to work with Education USA. And that's what I was doing for most of my gap year. And um, I did, uh, it did end up being a very transformative experience for me. So um, it felt right to, um, um, revise my essay for my college applications and focus it on my experience with Education USA. So essentially I was writing my essay about how I transitioned from this world of, you know, just being a student, just being in school to actually having a job, you know, having to wake up in the morning, be mindful of my assignments at work and interact with people or um, even learning how to uh, like be on the phone with people because I was very like socially anxious about that. And, um, you know, when people called me and I was like, I don't want to pick up the phone. <laughs> um, um, so like all those stories and kind of kind of just how that changed me and being a little bit introspective about that. Um, uh, essentially, that's what I that's what I did during my gap year, and that's how it affected my application. Thank you, thank you, and we want to say thank you again so much to Alexandra for giving us this opportunity um, to engage with you today. We really, really appreciated it, and thank you to everybody who's been able to call in today. I want to see if Alexandra has anything she would like to add as we close the webinar. I actually uh, was uh, following closely the the presentation, and I think you answered the. Uh, almost all, question, all questions that we receive from students as uh, Education USA advisors. And actually my last question that I asked Lori why you were admitted was I think the only question that we received that wasn't that answered at, at, at that moment. So 
Um, thank you for doing this with us. Um, it was a great experience and I do hope this video will have a lot of views in the, in the upcoming weeks and months. So we wish everyone the best of luck with their applications this year. We also want to encourage you to uh, just reassure you the fact that human beings are going to be reading your application. These human beings are also aware that you did not ask to apply to college in the United States during a global pandemic. So we are going to try as we review your application to read your applications with empathy, with care, with the understanding that you're going through a lot right now. Um, so if you have questions and if you want to engage with us, Remember that we're human beings. We understand that you didn't ask for this pandemic and we are trying as much as we can to make sure that you have opportunities to engage with us. You're not penalized for something you didn't ask for, such as a global pandemic. With that said, if you have questions, please do follow up with us. We also put a URL in the chat box on the side, which you can sign up for additional information from Hamilton College. Um, that URL is also available through Education USA. We've shared it with Alexandra. So if you want more information from Hamilton, please do consider uh, submitting that form and we'd love to stay in touch with you and let you know about upcoming virtual events. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Goodbye, have a nice day. Bye. Bye.